All right, hello. My name is Jonathan Greiner, and I'm going to be your instructor today. Today we're covering bloodborne pathogens, first aid and CPR, illness prevention, COVID-19. So we have some objectives to cover today. Um, <laughs> you know, it's it's going on year two of the pandemic, uh, maybe year three, even depending on how you look at it. And, you know, I don't want to go crazy. So my last objective here is utilize good practices to prevent hysteria. Um, you know, I don't know if the CDC would like me saying that, but I'm saying it anyway. Uh, but uh, there's some other things in, in the workplace and health wise that can affect us. Um, probably more likely than uh, a serious injury from COVID-19, but we're going to cover them all anyway. Uh, we kind of try to combine these topics as much as we can. So today we're going to be covering understanding what bloodborne pathogens are. This is not the most exciting training, but it's one of our, you know, kind of basic ones that OSHA requires us to go over every year, as well as understand how disease is transmitted and determine your personal risk of exposure and how to protect yourself, um, even from exposure and one major way of doing that is just good hygiene and engineering practices. Also, um, in the first aid CPR section, we're going to be covering responding appropriately. Um, if you're exposed to things, as well as responding appropriately if you're helping someone out. We're going to talk about understanding your right to medical evaluations, emergency medical situations, how to respond to those effectively. Uh, make sure that injured personnel receive appropriate care as well as preventing transmission of infectious diseases. And again, I'll repeat, utilizing good practices to prevent hysteria. Not a no-share requirement there. I'm kind of going out on my own limb, but uh, I just, you know, as a safety and health professional, I feel like it's uh, vital uh, to cover that element as well. So first off, what are bloodborne pathogens? Um, they are microorganisms that uh, are present in human blood. And that causes, causes disease. So a virus would be considered a bloodborne pathogen of any kind, a bacteria, parasites, fungi, etc. Uh, the big ones that we are concerned about with uh, in the workplace, typically and most commonly in emergency medical services such as EMTs, doctors, nurses, you know, uh, nurses aides, uh, emergency room professionals, etc., are HIV, hepatitis B, and hepatitis C. So HIV and AIDS, uh, a lot of you guys know this, especially if you were born before, you know, 1980 or any time during that period. Um, it was a big thing back in the day. It's kind of quieted down. A lot of medications uh, have helped that, but uh, HIV does lead to AIDS. Um, it, it attacks and depletes the human uh, immune system, which is, it's, you know, the reason it's so scary. Uh, early symptoms uh, resemble the flu. Uh, HIV antibody test is the only way to know for sure if someone has it. It does not survive outside of the body for any you know reasonable period of time. And even though there are medicines to help treat it, there is no cure. And that's one of the main reasons that uh, we're concerned about it. Hepatitis B, uh, this is a pretty common um, disease out there. Uh, it is serious. Um, you know, some symptoms include jaundice, fatigue, and abdominal pain. Um, no appetite for food, nausea, and vomiting are all kind of uh, in that. There is a vaccine for hepatitis B. In fact, we'll cover that here uh, in a little bit. And this one does survive outside the body. In fact, for a long time, at least a week in dried blood on surfaces such as a work table, knife, tools, broken glass, etc., that's why it's part important, and we'll talk about this uh, in a little bit, is our work practices, especially if, you know, if you're dealing with, you know, somebody's um, blood. Uh, it's important because a week is a long time for something to just, you know, be out there hanging out. Hepatitis C, uh, it is the most common chronic bloodborne infection, about 3.2 million or about double the amount affected by Hep B. And symptoms can take years to manifest. So, Flu-like symptoms, jaundice, dark urine fatigue, loss of appetite again, nausea and vomiting, and treatment is marginally effective. There is not a, a vaccine for this. You know, hepatitis is kind of, you know, it's one of those diseases that, uh, you know, affects the liver. Um, it also can be contracted or, you know, essentially you'll get it very easily if if, uh, if someone has a drinking problem, though. Hepatitis is, is very common with that, as well as diabetes kind of work, work together with that. Uh, there's another one, hepatitis D and even E. I don't think we've, it's gone to F yet, but as it progresses, they kind of add more letters, just like they're doing with the uh, COVID, except for for whatever reason with COVID, they're using Greek symbols, which I don't really understand why they're going that route, and they're just skipping certain ones based on who it might offend. And Anyway, we're not going to get into that, but uh, the hepatitis D, 
Um, a lot of people don't know a whole lot about it, but essentially it's a dormant virus that's only purpose is to blend with hepatitis B to make it much more, make somebody much more sick. So if uh, just, just for posterity there, you know that. Uh, transmission is pretty easy to isolate and determine how it's transmitted, unlike some other things out there. Uh, basically, if a sharper needle is contaminated with it, um, it can be passed to another person if that sharper needle punctures that person's skin and gets into their bloodstream. Uh, as well as broken skin if, if there's blood there. Uh, mucous membranes can also transmit some pathogens, not all pathogens. For example, HIV is not transmitted through the mucous membranes, uh, whereas hepatitis can be. So routes of exposure, again, contact with a bleeding coworker. You know, if you're somebody taking care of somebody um, and you're not using gloves, etc., cetera, uh, it can be transmitted. Uh, same thing with administering first aid, even if you touch a contaminated surface. And that's where, you know, this, this requirement for this training became so pertinent is because people were getting sick just by, you know, other people not cleaning stuff up. And so, you know, that's where they really put this out there and said, hey, we need to train people so that they really understand the hazard of not cleaning up surfaces. Now, me, myself, um, I don't know, I just grew up with siblings and we were all pretty accident prone. So cleaning up blood, um, not fortunately large amounts of it, but that was just, you know, part of growing up. Like, hey, you know, just, you clean that stuff up because it's gross and you don't just want it everywhere. Um, kind of surprising that people need to be trained that. But yes, if there's blood and someone's been hurt, uh, clean it up with some bleach, you know, get something, you know, not, you know, what else are you doing? Uh, also contact with contaminated products or equipment in restrooms and then using a tool, uh, covered in dried blood again, you know, just maybe a bad omen there to, Oh, Billy just cut his arm off with a saw. Let me go use it to cut some two by fours. You know, it's a little bit strange without just cleaning that up. So the bloodborne pathogens law, real quick, essentially it requires that there's a medical surveillance program where if you know somebody does get infected or somebody does get exposed, then they get tested right away. Because again, you know, just like anything, somebody who doesn't know they're carrying something can be, uh, it can be a little bit, uh, it can create a worse situation than already exists. Hepatitis B vaccination is free. Uh, to any worker in America, but typically really only, you know, the people that are going to get this are going to be people who are consistently working around um, blood, such as, again, EMTs, doctors, nurses, etc. Signs and labels are other things that we use, and then there's other engineering uh, practices that people use. So, um, universal precautions, and then again, to, you know, prevent hysteria, um, basically if you see blood or, you know, any sort of mucus or somebody from somebody, um, you know, something from somebody around, treat it as though it's infected. You know, if, if you see somebody bleeding and you don't know their entire medical history, even if it's a nosebleed, you know, don't just like, you know, start touching that part of that. I mean, you know, COVID-19 has changed things a little bit where people are a little bit more apprehensive to just start touching others. But, you know, in a first aid situation, this can happen. So, also barriers such as gloves, which would be considered a barrier, aprons, etc., uh, to avoid contact with infected body fluids. And then again, I, I know I've beat this to death, but immediately clean it up. You know, don't just leave it out there, um, you know, potentially affecting other people. So I already mentioned gloves as, as PPE. That's probably the most common. Gloves and masks in medical uh, are pretty common. And then same, you know, whether you're applying a bandage, even if it's gauze, even if it's something small. Um, you know, if you're touching another person and there's any bodily fluid coming from that person, good idea to wear gloves. Also masks, uh, as I mentioned, and then spray guards, face shields, etc. Um, so this is, you know, we're all very familiar with these. Um, you know, there's KN95s. Uh, if you're giving CPR, it's a good idea to use a CPR mask for that purpose which is essentially like a one-way valve um, where air goes in, but any fluids or you know, other things don't come back to the person who's you know, uh, admitting CPR. And then be prepared to use uh, imp impromptu barriers such as a garbage bag, plastic, paper, even your shirt. You know, I mean, depending on the situation, you may not have a CPR mask like around, um, but you need to help somebody. So there's other ways that you can uh, um, kind of protect yourself. And again, with a, you know, the breathing, the respiration during CPR, uh, its effectiveness is kind of in question, but uh, uh, moving on. Avoiding puncture wounds is another big one. Um, so if there is a contaminated item, especially a sharp or, you know, even glass, you know, they don't want you to be 
now at home you may be a little bit bold you know you drop a glass or your kid drops a glass and you know you're picking it up like a superhero you know not cutting yourself you know superman and and kryptonite just you know not <laughs> no damage at all but at work you know don't take the risk use the broom um there's if there's something that could potentially cut you obviously using cut resistant gloves while utilizing those tools is important and then if something does get contaminated even if it's you and you just nick your finger or something clean it off don't just be like ah, it'll be fine you know my blood's okay um just as a good practice again everybody should be cleaning everything if it gets dirty or contaminated so gloves and glasses um, are pretty common for ppe um, there is some such thing as a bodily fluid disposal kit again we're not typically working with that uh, we're not going to have those usually at your typical workplace but if you're in the medical industry definitely and then you know as far as a bleach concentration you know you can use 100 percent bleach on stuff but uh it's pretty strong and not necessary 10 percent one to ten parts is is usually like i think it's like I think two capfuls a gallon or something. I have to look up that ratio, but one to ten, you know. So you know, there's about an ounce and a capful, you know, compared to ten ounces. So um, just keep that in mind. And then dispose of contaminated items um, if anything is disposed of, and if it's a sharp object, um, you know, there's different ways you can do it. Um, you want to use a paper absorbent towel to soak up residual liquids, and then whether depending on whether or not these go in a biohazard bag really depends on amount first of all uh, second of all if you know whether or not we we know that that person has something which you're not always going to know but you know again depending on the amount of blood or bodily fluid a biohazard bag may not be required you know again you get a nosebleed you know and you got a couple drops that came down it's dry outside you blow your nose there's some blood on it we don't need to shut the whole location down you know get the helicopter flying in you know again you know, I want to talk about reality and preventing mass hysteria because uh, that's just something I guess in 2021, 2022, uh, you have to uh, remind people of. So again, biohazard disposal, not typically, you know, in our daily bailiwick, but, uh, you know, they do have sharp container boxes for this purpose. Um, and then again, regulated waste. And there's a definition for regulated waste and any regulated waste does need to have the biohazard uh, tag on it. Again, a major reason for this is, Back in the day, um, at hospitals, doctors would administer shots to people, um, break the needle, and then throw it in the trash bag, just the regular old paper, you know, paper basket. And a janitor would be cleaning up, pick up the, you know, the basket or the bag from the basket and swing into their leg, jab them with a needle, and they'd have Hep C, you know. And that's just not not a great thing, you know. So they created the shard boxes for that, um, and then also, you know, if if there's you know some sort of danger it's going to be labeled so if i'm billy going in there to you know clean up something as a janitor or waste staff i'm seeing the biohazard bag as a as a definite hazard rather than just treating it like any other you know uh, recycling paper box or something so exposure incident if something does occur um, just like any incident you need to immediately report it after providing care and response so wash cut and uh, skin thoroughly rinse nose and mouth Flush eyes with water or clean sterile solution. Clean all the contaminated surfaces again, you know, with bleach or other antibacterial material, and then report it. Then there'll be an evaluation. You know, if this does happen, the doctor's going to talk to you and say, "Hey, um, you know, how are you doing? Let's do a blood test, etc." That's that's pretty pretty standard requirement. All right, again, the hepatitis B vaccine, uh, it is free to you if you want it. Um, it is effective on most adults. I have a family member who cannot take the hepatitis B vaccine because uh, she has something where if she takes it, it'll kill her. So not for everybody. Um, and then, you know, if you're not vaccinated, which you can, interestingly, uh, for this standard with OSHA, they let you decline the vaccine and you can continue to work, but then there's, you know, additional precautions you need to take. Um, so that is an option for blowing pathogens. So kind of wrapping this up, um, if there's an incident, you need to report it. Um, Bloodborne pathogens can, can cause chronic fatal diseases. So, you know, again, if there's any bodily fluids, blood, etc., you want to get it cleaned up right away and take care of business. So just so you know, we're about halfway through the training today, so we're moving right along. Um, but yeah, it is important, you know, if, if you're administering first aid, um, CPR of some, some form, you're protecting yourself as well and thinking about that. Obviously, we see somebody down and hurt. 
the first thing we want to do is help them. But we also have to think about ourselves so that any issue that they have doesn't become our issues as well. All right, so basic first aid and CPR. Um, as I said, my name is Jonathan Greiner. And, um, you know, this is some, this is an area my, I've had medical professionals in my family. Um, both my grandmas, uh, were in the medical field. My mom was in the medical field. Um, my father was in the military and he did a lot of, you know, field medic type stuff. So this is something that's kind of been around me my whole life. This is not a fully, um, you know, it's not the four hour, uh, CPR first aid course or five hour, depending on which, uh, group you use. This is based on American Red Cross. It's the very simple basic first aid and CPR, recognizing an injury, uh, what to do for that injury and how to get them to the appropriate people as soon as possible and make sure that they're taken care of in the meantime. So very basic. So before giving care, we have some key points to remember. Uh, here are those key points. Um, are the purpose here is to help identify and eliminate potentially hazardous conditions. As a first responder, um, not a, you know, a technical first responder, but uh, a literal first responder. You're the first person to the scene because you see it. Make sure that nothing else is going to happen to that person. Do they need to move away from an area? Does something need to move away from them? You know, uh, if someone was hit by a vehicle, for, for example, don't leave the vehicle in neutral uphill from that person would be a great example, right? If something fell on them and there's more stuff that's likely to fall, do we, you know, can we stop that stuff from falling or move them away from where that thing's likely to fall? That's the, that really needs to be our first you know, assessment of that situation. So the first thing we're going to do is assess. And then we're going to recognize it and make appropriate decisions. It's difficult to run through every possible scenario. You know, As a safety person, I've responded to a myriad of, of type, different types of injuries, from frostbite to someone just dying in their sleep. And you know, in these situations, you know, everyone is different what, you know, what the appropriate response is. So really that's that logic and getting people involved to help make the right decision. So this course, again, teaches just basic stuff um, and the skills needed to give immediate care until more advanced. So we're, we're kind of the, the middleman between the EMTs coming in and making sure that they're you know, stable until that point. So if there's a diabetic emergency, the reason I put this one first is there's a lot of people with diabetes out there, both type A and type B, and it's a pretty serious disease. Uh, I talked about this last year in this training. Um, I recently made a, a good friend with like a, a, a type A diabetic person who's like severely diabetic. Like they eat a sandwich, you know, and don't manage it. Like they, they could be dead by noon. You know, it's like, whoa, like it's, it's a very common and kind of crazy uh, thing. So if somebody is a diabetic, um, you know, usually they're going to have some sort of um, symbol on, you know, like a, a bracelet or something, letting people know that. So if you find them passed out, you kind of know what the issue is. But if you see that, um, essentially the body's not producing, producing enough insulin or does not use it effectively. If they're conscious and able to swallow, you're going to give sugar. If they can't swallow um, and unconscious, you're going to call 911. That's it, period. No, like, you know, let's cool them down or get their feet up in the air. None of that. 911 right now. Uh, they're going to be able to take, take care of them. So for poisoning, um, you know, not very common, but more common than you'd think. Uh, if you read through the OSHA, you know, kind of injury log, which I know, like me, on the weekend, that's what you're doing. Just like, let's, what's going on, you know, in, in, is if we don't have enough bad news, let's go find it. But um, there's actually a lot of poisonings that happen, um, usually through airborne concentrations of things. Typically, workers aren't drinking chemicals. You know, it does happen uh, if somebody puts a chemical into like a Gatorade bottle or a Mountain Dew bottle or something. Uh, but usually that's not a daily. But if somebody is poisoned or a foreign, you know, typically chemical substance enters the body, it doesn't have to be through ingestion, but uh, anything, then, you know, typically inhalation, again, is the most common. It can be swallowed or ingested. Um, it can be absorbed on the skin. That's another common poisoning. Usually absorptions aren't fatal, uh, but they can make you very sick. And then lastly, injection. Again, we talked about that. Um, you know, I heard of a guy a couple years ago, he was, uh, using a hot, you know, a, a pressure washer, hot pressure washer to clean, you know, trucks off. He's cleaning his truck off, um, for whatever reason, looked down and his boot was, uh, dirty. So he's like, Hey, you know, I got the solution for that right here in my hand. So he takes this pressure washer, cuts through the boot, uh, hits the bone 
the water is, is so, such high pressure, it um, you know ricochets off the bone into his skin, up into his leg, like, like all the way up. I think it was past his ankle, if I remember correctly. And the reason he got sick was because the grease actually traveled with that water into his bloodstream and, and made him really sick. So that would be an injection. Not Again, not very common, but can happen. Uh, treatment. Uh, poisoning, really, I'll be honest with you. Um, the, the only thing you're going to do, you can call the poison center, and nine times out of ten, you know, they're just going to tell you what not to do. Uh, so that's what they're good for. But 911 is like the first thing if somebody really gets uh, in a serious situation. Um, you know, and, and chemicals in the eyes would be considered um, typically it's a poisoning. So a lot of times 911 is just your best. It's your best option. If the person's fine and they don't need an ambulance, great. But if they do, um, that, that time, that reaction time becomes extremely important. So we want to make sure they get the care that they need right away. All right. So in any type of injury, so if somebody becomes unconscious at your workplace, or even if you're out and about in life, and we'll talk about the Good Samaritan rules here in a couple slides, but if somebody's unconscious, the best position to keep them in and to place them in is something called the recovery position. And that is what you see here in the image. Uh, somebody, you essentially take their hand, you put it on their chin, um, and the, uh, the, um, from the same side, you're going to lift up that leg and then flip them over so that one hand is under their head, and that same side that, that has their arm under their head, that leg is across their body. And that prevents anything from coming up from their lungs and, and filling their lungs, any mucus from them choking on mucus or, or vomit or anything of that nature. It keeps them their airways open and prepares them essentially for medical transport. So before, um, if you're the only person there and have to call 911, before you do that, you want to put them in a position where they're safe and nothing uh, uh, bad is going to happen to them while they're waiting for, the, for transportation. So there's another thing I like to mention when we're talking about first aid, and that is what we've seen statistically when an incident happens, or when an incident happens, things that prevent people from acting um, to help that person. And the first thing is the presence of others. You know, people will look around like, am I really the most qualified person to be doing this? You know, like, I don't want to start doing this and someone to look at me and tell me I'm dumb and I'm doing the wrong thing. Um, also uncertainty about the person's, person's condition. Is this the right thing to do in this moment for this person? Uh, fear of catching a disease, which is especially recently very reasonable. Uh, fear of doing something wrong, being sued, or being unsure of when to call 911. And I've actually ran into this situation where somebody was in trouble and I got a call like, should we call 911? The answer, if, if you have to ask the question, should I call 911? The answer to that is always yes. Like it's never like, man, 50 50. It's 100% certain. Call 911. Worst case or best case scenario, that person is fine, right? They like, you know, you thought they were, you know, uh, knocked unconscious, but they're just asleep. And, you know, for whatever reason, they wake up, they're like, oh, I'm fine. You know, um, you can call 911 back and be like, hey, you know what? Cancel that. This guy's perfectly fine. Versus those critical minutes passing you by without calling emergency medical uh, personnel. You wanna make sure that the EMTs are getting there as soon as possible. Worst case, it's not necessary, you can call them off. You know, uh, Maybe a small charge to somebody, usually insurance will cover that because they'd rather pay for the EMTs to leave the shop and come right back rather than you know um, having a, a much worse situation on their hands because they weren't called. Another element of that is the Good Samaritan Law. So if in a workplace or you know along the side of the road you try to help somebody and obviously within your training you know you're not doing a, an emergency trach you know with a pen or something or a pen knife you know like oh this guy needs brain surgery on the side of the road um, but if you're doing you know your general getting them to safety um, and they break a rib or you know something happens to them that worsens their condition unintentionally we are covered by something called the Good Samaritan Law. And that means this individual is operating within their knowledge um, and within their level of training to help this person out. And obviously, as you know, your level of knowledge and training increases, that changes, right? Like if you're a medical doctor and you come upon a car crash and you just push the person over the side of a bridge, you know, to drown, you're like, well, I was just trying to help. You know, that's probably not going to be a, a <laughs> I don't know, doctors who are doing this sort of thing, but that probably is not going to be a defensible act. But in your general run of the mill, like I got him away from the, the car was on fire and I pulled him to safety and yeah, I, he broke his arm or his wrist during the process. Like that's acceptable. Wrists heal, ribs heal, arms heal, you know, uh, death does not heal. So 
Uh, maybe, you know, someday, you know, according to the Bible, in 1 Thessalonians 4, when Jesus comes back, we're all going to go to heaven, then death is healed. But until that point, you know, uh, a broken rib, that's okay. Uh, wrist, etc. You know, um, it's unfortunate, but getting somebody to safety is is the and, and the important thing. So again, acting in good faith, are not negligent and act within the scope of your training or knowledge. Um, again, no emergency trachs or brain surgeries on the side of the road. There's another element of this is consent, right? So one thing, <clears throat> you know, uh, if you've been following culture, consent is important in a lot of different ways, and, and in medical treatment, it's important as well. Right. So let's say someone's having a panic attack. Right. And you come up and you're just touching them and messing with them. And they're like, leave me alone. You're like, I'm helping. You know, that can that can potentially get you in trouble. So the Good Samaritan law uh, covers you in time of unconsciousness when that person's not able to, um, you know, essentially provide that consent. But to obtain consent, you know, when someone's in shock or has been through an accident, usually they don't just want a stranger grabbing them. And even people that are close to them just grabbing them. You know, that's usually not the way you'd approach a situation like that. So you'd state your name. Hi, I'm John. Uh, it looks like, you know, I'm trained in first aid. It appears that you've hurt your head. May I help you? Um, you know, I, I'm just going to move you over here so you can get some fresh air. Or this car is on fire and I don't want you to, you know, be harmed by that. I'm going to drag you over here to the side of the road, etc. You know, you kind of want to talk them through what's going on in a very clear way. You don't just want to start grabbing someone and dragging them across the road, you know, after a horrific accident because that can increase trauma. So again, the idea of care is, is the whole element here. You know, incident management, case management, first aid, CB, it all has to do with patient care, victim care, um, and that's really the point. So even in an emergency situation, to the you know, to the best of your ability, you want to kind of let that person know that you're there to help them. Not like the government's here to help you, but, you know, it actually helps somebody. Um, so going more in depth, that's just essentially before you even provided care, right? Like recovery position is kind of like the only procedure so far we've even discussed. Everything else has been pretty, you know, um, general, you know, general, get consent, you know, you're okay to help somebody. But now we're going to talk about specifics. So if somebody's in a life-threatening situation, unconsciousness, we consider to be life-threatening because we don't know if they're passed out because they saw blood or because they had a heart attack. We have no idea. So unconsciousness is instant, instantly considered a life-threatening injury. Not breathing or having trouble breathing, choking, persistent chest pain, no signs of life. Obviously, that's a you know, life-threatening situation. Uh, severe bleeding, shock, or seizures that recur and last more than five minutes. The reason they say that is some people have you know short, small seizures, medical conditions, etc. So it may not be life-threatening. Maybe Good to get them to safety, but maybe not, you know, uh, bring in the helicopter just yet. Because so in key points here, um, why do people die? You know, some people would say it's COVID. COVID is still not the number one cause of death. Um, it may be, you know, comorbidity thing, but statistically it's motor vehicle crashes, falls, poisonings, drownings, and chokings are the most common uh, reasons for fatalities. And two basic types of injuries that we see are soft tissue and musculoskeletal. So that's typically where we're going to see all, the majority of our injuries. Different types of wound. Again, a soft tissue is the most common. Um, that's layers of skin, fat, and muscle. So, you know, you, essentially a paper kit, a uh, paper cut rather, would be a type of soft -ish tissue injury. I mean, even if it's a small one, soft tissue. Uh, it could be at the skin level, such as a paper cut, or something deeper, requiring stitches. Um, a physical injury that damages layers of skin is, layers of skin is called a wound. Wounds are typically classified as either open wounds or closed wounds. And you'll see that a lot in injury, open or, or closed. And open essentially means, again, open to atmosphere, meaning oxygen's getting to it, bacteria is getting to it. That increases the level of severity in a lot of cases. So if it's a closed wound, essentially what we want to do is keep things from um, getting uh, too swollen because that, that restricts blood flow. So we're going to apply direct pressure, uh, which keeps the swelling down. We're going to elevate the injured body part, which also keeps the swelling down, and then also keep it cool, but not directly on the skin, but uh, typically some sort of barrier, even if it's a cloth. You want to keep it cool. Again, keep the blood flowing, not letting it swell up too much, because typically when the body has uh, <clears throat> an injury or a problem, it's going to send a lot of blood there, um, which is good. But if, if, if there's, especially there's some damage, that blood flow can be restricted and actually create um, clots, which can later cause other problems. So uh, essentially caring for a closed wound, just remember pressure, 
elevate and coolness, right? That's all I need. PEC. Uh, types of open wounds, you have abrasions and lacerations. Um, you know, in a puncture, for example, you know, you have your skin, the fat, and then the muscle underneath. Um, it goes all the way through those. And depending on the level of abrasion or laceration, it can also go through all three layers as well. Controlling open wound bleeding. This is, again, very basic, right? We're not going through different types for punctures versus abrasions. We're just talking generals here. So elevating, the reason you do that restricts blood. If you're losing blood, you don't want to send more blood to that place, right? We want to stop the blood through clotting, et cetera, uh, at the skin level. And the way that we do that is by gauze. Um, so if you apply a dressing and it needs another dressing, never tear off the first one. Um, just keep adding, you know, it's kind of like license plate stickers, right? Just keep putting them on there just over and over again. And eventually that's going to prevent the blood from flowing out and uh, prevent that person from bleeding out. So open wound blue, uh, bleeding again, um, gauze, roller type bandages, and then you want some pressure there. So you want to make sure that you tie the knot over the wound um, and then tape that dressing. And that's so we're applying the most pressure we can on the wound itself. And then the most important thing for that person at that point is making sure that um, they have circulation of their fingers and toes. Because again, if our body's sending all of our blood to that wound, because you, you're cut, so it's sending blood there, but then you know, you're know you losing blood, so that's a bad thing. So we want to make sure that our circulation is going good and the body's operating normally. For burns, um, different types of burns, there's thermal burns, chemical burns, electrical burns, and radio, radioactive burns. So a lot of different types of burns. Um, depending on the type of burn, the treatment does change, and we'll go through those here in a moment. So in a minor burn, you definitely want to check, here's some do's and don'ts, you definitely want to check the scene for safety, like why is this person burned? Am I going to get burned in helping them? Uh, remove the source of the burn first. Um, you want to cool first and second degree burns with cool running water, and then cover wound loosely with a sterile dressing. The reason, you know, in this instance, unlike bleeding, that you want that blood to work for you, right? It's going to cool. It's going to cool that wound down from the inside. So we we don't want to pack it tight and, and apply pressure because that's going to restrict blood flow. And blood is our friend in a burn situation. So don't use ice. Ice is not your friend in these instances. Uh, you don't want to break blisters. Um, you do not want to remove pieces of clothing stuck to the burn. That's a burn unit group, right? Because you can actually tear um, into the muscle, uh, even in the fat, when you do that. So uh, don't use any type of ointment on severe burns. Not going to help you. Uh, don't immerse them in water. And don't touch the area of a burn uh, with anything that's dirty, because essentially whatever that dirt is is going to embed itself into that wound and then fester and cause infection. So we want to make sure essentially you keep them. I mean, if someone gets seriously burned, basically you wouldn't want to keep anything from touching it that's dirty. That's the most important thing. Water's not going to help you. Ointment, ice, there's nothing you can really do for that person except for get them to a burn unit immediately. Chemical burns, um, if there's contaminated clothing that's going to you know, uh, spread that burn, you want to get that off of them. Uh, brush dry off dry chemical, uh, flush burn with water for 15 to 20 minutes of a chemical Burn again, water's okay, uh, ice is not. And then flush eyes of chemical in eye for 15 to 20 minutes. And that's pretty much across the board for anything in your eyes. All right, uh, muscle, bone, and joint injuries. Um, so there's two types of fracture. We talked about open and closed wounds. There's also open and closed fracture. Again, it has to do with whether or not the skin is broken. And then you have displacement, which or dislocation, which is displacement of a bone at the joint, um, specifically. So not a broken bone. Obviously, a broken bone is something else. So then you have sprains and strains, which are much more common. A sprain is a partial or complete tearing or stretching of a ligament, and a strain is just a stretching or tearing of muscles or tendon fibers, uh, typically at a minor level. These are usually not going to get worse after the initial incident unless there's too much pressure put on it. So essentially, um, you know, what we want to do is get weight off of it, um, remove pressure, etc. So for shock, um, when someone is either been an injury um, or seen somebody be an injury, shock can happen. Um, so what'll happen, and then internal bleeding will also turn our body into shock. Basically our body's like too much, overloaded, don't know what to do. Um, so in that case, you wanna keep someone rested, you wanna keep their pulse down because a rapid pulse is gonna increase their level of shock. And then if someone does have internal bleeding, which again is, is, is a really big uh, precursor for shock, you're going to notice tender swollen 
bruised or hard areas of the body. So that area is going to be unnaturally hard, you know, it's almost if it was a bone. Um, so you're going to feel that difference. And then also a rapid weak pulse. So very fast, but not very strong, not, not a strong pulse. And then skin that feels cool or moist, moist or looks pale or bluish. Those are also signs of internal bleeding. Now, typical day, you're not going to see that, but it is possible. Now for minor injuries in care. So let's say somebody, you know, they're out there, they tweak their back, right? They, they step on some scoria and this happens a lot. Um, their ankle, you know, just isn't quite tight. It's feeling rolled or sprained or something. You know, <clears throat> unless you're a medical professional, you don't want to assess that injury and provide consultation for care. That's where you can potentially get in trouble. Like, ah, Billy, you're fine. You don't need to see a doctor. And then he did need to see a doctor and he's going to be like, I didn't go because Billy told me not to. That's not a good situation. Um, you you kind of want to operate again within your level of knowledge and experience. So there are companies out there that do initial um, assessments of individuals for minor injury. Now, guy loses a finger. You're not like, ah, we'll see how it feels in 10 minutes. You're not doing that, right? That guy's going to the hospital. But guy, again, hurts his ankle, sprains his back a little, it strains his back. It's like, man, I just, you know, I'm not feeling very good. That may not be an initial, like, get him to the emergency room. So there's two different, um, so a couple other things. People do have a right to see a medical professional, but it's common practice for them to go to an occupational physician rather than an emergency room for non-emergent situations, which just makes perfect sense. So um, there's a bunch of different companies out here. Extreme MD actually has uh, physical offices uh, around the Bakken. Uh, Landmark Medical is another one. And then you have companies like Axiom and Work Partners um, and Extreme MD where you, there's an it's a telemedicine situation where you can call an 800 number and they're going to tell you, essentially you're going to give them the, you know, the nature of the incident. Um, and they'll tell you whether or not that person needs to see a doctor or needs additional care if it's in question. Right? So there's a bunch of outfits out here that do this. Um, I'm going to include a link actually in this training, uh, right below the video there, you're going to see a link, uh, where you can click it and it's going to show you where every occupational physician, uh, is in North Dakota, in the Western North Dakota. So if you need to go, you can pull this. I'm sure you're just going to have this saved on your, your home screen of your phone because you know, you're cool like me and, uh, you can click that and it's actually going to show you where, where these people are. And what that also does is it prevents, you know, some emergency rooms, like they're, they're busy, they're packed. You come in, you're like, my arm hurts. They're like, here's some Vicodin. You know, that may be an instant recordable uh, injury when it's not a recordable injury. You know, it's the, the idea isn't try to get away from it, but not to over, um, you know, uh, overestimate an injury uh, rather than underestimating it. So our last um, uh, training today is the illness prevention. So obviously, you know, first aid is important, um, but the best thing we can do to prevent that is, is preventing injury or illness. And specifically for this one, we're talking about COVID, COVID um, the flus, I'm surprised we're having to do this two years later. I thought we'd be well beyond this now, but as we've seen that this thing mutates and changes. So the reason we go through this essentially is obviously to provide safeguards against infection if we can prevent it. And then, you know, some means of, of if you do have it, preventing from spreading it to others. So our goal is to keep, you know, the number of people that get viral infections low and then keep keep the business operating as best as possible because we don't want people to be sick. Um, so before you even leave the house, I like to start there. Make sure your stuff's clean, you know, practice good hygiene yourself. Um, you know, if you're having food, pack it into sealed bags, lunch boxes, use mouthwash, you know, keep basically keep yourself clean. And then temperature and not so much even more with the new variants, but in the older ones, your temperature will increase, um, you know, with, uh, uh, with COVID. So, if you're traveling around, not a bad idea to use gloves in public spaces. Um, you know, uh, it's just not a bad idea if you can. And, you know, if you're touching things and people that other people have touched, again, hand sanitizer, this is nothing new. I'm not going to pretend we're, you know, um, changing the world here with this knowledge, but, you know, we got to go through it. So we're going to make it through it. And it really is, it's a lot of common sense, right? Keeping things clean, work surfaces clean. If someone's been sick, you know, in an area, you know, cleaning that stuff and, um, handshaking, you know, I think we've kind of moved back into that. And I think more or less, uh, we've seen, you know, a significant drop. So people are becoming less concerned, but good practice is, you know, you don't know somebody don't be touching them a lot, you know, just not a terrible idea. Anyway, 
Uh, PPE and shop, again, you know, and one thing that's unique that they did since we first created this training is, and I kind of mention it here, is they consider people that you work with every day almost like a family, right? So you don't need to treat the people, now depending on the size of the workforce you work with, right? Like if you work with the same three people every day, every single day, day in and day out, we don't want to treat them like complete strangers. Again, we want to avoid the hysteria that surrounds this. In a lot of cases, they've considered that a work family, meaning like, hey, these are your people. But you also, just like your regular family, you want to prevent them from being sick. So um, if you know you're going to be working with them, then you know maybe you know, let them know if you don't feel well. Um, keep people um, communicated with. So hygiene, just like I mentioned in other areas, you know, keep things clean, keep your hands clean, keep your breath clean. You know, these are things you should be doing anyway, but you know, it does help prevent um, the spread of diseases. Um, so you know, if you can avoid the public places, you know, more or less, just pick your, you know, pick your battle. Like, is this something I really want to do? Okay, then maybe wear a mask depending on where you're at. And just like anything, you know, with COVID uh, protection, we've, we've heard about it, masks, gloves, and hand sanitizer. In distance, those are like your best friends. Uh, the other thing I want to mention uh, before we wrap up um, is if you do feel sick, right? So they lowered the um, quarantine period to five days now. So which is good. I mean, one, because, you know, it's a reasonable period of time, but two, like if you're not feeling good one day and you can't get a test, like no one's got a, you typically have like a COVID test in their back pocket. Um, just you know, say, Hey guys, I'm going to get checked out in the morning. Um, give me a little bit of time to get checked because people don't want to miss work if they don't have to. And if you have a cold, you know, it, it's not a life or death situation, you know, go get checked out take a day, worst case scenario, you're out for five days, right? So we're not talking two weeks, a month, whatever it used to be. Um, but get checked out, you know, make sure you're good. Don't spread it around. If you feel like you're not, you know, feeling so hot, get tested, um, communicate that effectively. But in a lot of cases, we've had people who just got like, that's our policy at base and safety. Somebody says, Hey, I'm not feeling very good. And we're like, all right, well, do you feel like you can work? Yeah, I feel like I can work. I just, you know, I don't want to get anyone sick. All right, take an hour, go get a COVID test. Let us know how it is. And then they're back to work by nine o'clock or 10 o'clock in the morning. Not a big deal. You know, so it's, it's just extra steps and precautions, which you don't want to be as somebody who gets sick and just doesn't tell anybody. And it's like, yeah, we'll, we'll figure it out. And then you got 15, 20 people off from COVID. Obviously, the initial concern, uh, which has changed, was everyone's going to die if they get COVID. Uh, we've seen that that statistically is not the case. But because of the regulations and mandates and everything, you know, we do have to protect people. And so we don't want to have to have a whole office shut down because one person just didn't communicate or think it was very serious. So a little bit of personal responsibility there. Again, we don't want to blow this up. There's enough people doing that, but I'm just giving you some common basic steps to protect yourself and others so that, again, the hysteria is avoided. So that's all we got this month. Very grateful for, for you guys tuning into our stuff and, and paying attention. Um, at the end here, obviously, there's a quiz. Uh, if you want to review us on Facebook or Google, uh, I think we're going to give away a shotgun here uh, in the next month. So if you put your name in, you'll you'll have a drawing for that. If you just write a review on one of those one of those things, I think we're also on Yelp and LinkedIn and a bunch of places. So you know, let people know you like us. Let people know you hate us. Don't be too harsh. Um, and uh, look forward to seeing you next month.